Good morning. <clears throat> if you are new, you're an honored guest. And if you would, take out your bulletin, and we invite you, if you're new, just to tear off that perforated strip there, fill it out, gives us an opportunity to then prowl at your doorstep. Yes, we are going to then case you, and we're going to follow you around until you decide to make this church your home. <laughs> you think, I'm joking. No, I am joking. But um, This is a way that we can introduce ourselves to you and love for you to introduce yourself to us. A couple of things. Next weekend is our community life meeting. Here um, in the church, we'll do it over in the chapel at 5 o'clock. And so if you want to be a part of that, just kind of the update annual meeting of the church to see what's going on and to hear a report from all our staff. And it's just kind of a, uh, about an hour, but just good family time. And so you're invited to join us. And then um, I wanted to make a special um, heads up to the fact that we've got a, a special elective that's coming up that's being taught by one of our elders, Ben Merchant, and um, one of our staff um, who um, Jeff and I got together last, probably about six months ago, and began to brainstorm, you know, if we offered classes, each class was like six to seven weeks, kind of a, an adult catechism, if you will. What are some things that we would love to get into your head to help you think rightly? You think rightly, it increases the odds that you behave correctly. And so we kind of created this curriculum, about six, seven, eight classes, and we're going to just keep presenting one of them a semester. The one that we're presenting this semester, starting February 1 for seven weeks, is called Essentials. And it's really the essentials of the Christian doctrine so that you can really build a foundation of thinking rightly. This doesn't replace your um, ABF that you're a part of, but we do, if you're going to be a part of this essentials class, you would have to take a hiatus away from your ABF for just a brief time. But we want to try and get into your head the best that we possibly can. And so these are really, they're, they're kind of like seminary level classes that hopefully will be an encouragement to you. Well, We've been doing a study on the book of Judges, and, um, you know, this particular week, it's our third cycle that we're going to be examining. In a view from the zoo, written by a fellow by the name of Gary Richmond, he was a former zookeeper, he wrote this. He said, raccoons go through a glandular change at about 24 months of age. After that, they often attack their owners. It's said that a 30-pound raccoon can equal a 100-pound dog in a scrap. So having a pet raccoon it is really not a good idea. Richmond writes about a friend of his that listened politely to him as he explained the coming danger. And he says this, the raccoon owner said, it will be different for me. Bandit, the name of her raccoon, uh, wouldn't hurt me. He just wouldn't. Well, Richmond reports three months later after this conversation, the owner of that raccoon, um, this owner went through plastic surgery for facial lacerations when her adult raccoon attacked her for no apparent reason. You know, you think sin often comes into our life dressed in an adorable disguise. And we play with it. And it's be it, we easily assume uh, it'll be different for me. Two weeks ago, I shared a quote from Joe Aldrich that said, the enemy will wait sometimes 40 years if necessary to set a trap for you. We've been studying the book of Judges, and it seems as if the nation of Israel will experience about 40 years of consistency, and then they experience, if you will, a spiritual glandular change. And then the nation's sin comes out, and it comes out of their cage in horrible ways. And if we as individuals aren't intentional about our relationship with the Lord, then what will happen is sin can come out of our figurative cage in unexpected ways. Last week, we observed the influence of a physically limited judge. His name was Ahud. He was a left-handed man. He was crippled in his right hand. And um, he had unequaled character, so much so that he set the nation up for an unprecedented 80 years of silence but as the saying goes, all good things come to an end. 
Remember the cycle, it happens seven times over the course of 400 years in the study of the book of Judges, and it's always the same. After a period of peace and silence, well, the nature in us goes through a glandular change, and then we sin. And then we fall victim to our sin, and we end up serving the sin of our choice, and then we cry out to God, supplication, we say, God, help us. And then God is so good, and he rescues us, salvation. And then there's a period of silence. And you know, in the book of Judges, that period of silence is anywhere from 40 to 80 years, based upon the leadership of that particular judge and the tone that they set. We go through the same process individually that we have argued. All of us go through this, where we sin, and then we end up serving the sin that we choose to follow, and then we cry out to God. We think, God, how did I get myself in this mix? Will you help me? And then God rescues us, and then there's a period of silence. We are most vulnerable during that period of silence, where we think we've got the tiger by the tail, and life is good, and we're just coasting along at life. And then all of a sudden, through the back door, all of a sudden, some behavior creeps up because we aren't a we're not ready. We, we fall asleep at the wheel. Last week, we looked, I zeroed in on that stage of the cycle called sin and even asked the question, why do we sin? Well, we've got this nature that chooses like a magnet to follow after it. This morning, I want to highlight briefly this whole area of servitude. We forget that our sin always leads to consequences, always. There's always consequences to our sin. We end up being enslaved by the sin that we're enticed by. And there's consequences to it. In 1799, an American ship named Ship Nancy it was captured by the British cutter in the Caribbean. The officers of the ship called Nancy were arrested and charged with carrying contraband. However, before they reached port, they managed to toss any incriminating papers overboard, and they forged some new papers. As the trial drew to an end, it was evident that because of a lack of evidence, the crew would be released. But before the judge could acquit them, there was another British ship in the same area that harpooned a shark. Now, sharks have a very slow digestive system. And when the shark was slid open, the original papers of the Nancy were preserved in the shark's insides. The papers got to the trial just in time to provide a guilty conviction. The point of the illustration is simple. Our sin will find us out. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 tells us that. It says, don't be deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever man sows, he's also going to reap. Well, now let's look at the third cycle in the book of Judges. The first one was about a judge named Othniel. The second was about a judge named Ahud. And now we're ready for chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Now, before we jump into it, before I read chapter 4, verse 1, there's something interesting to know. We're going to be looking at chapter 4 and a specific judge, but chapter 5 is interesting. We won't have time to study chapter 5, but what you would find is chapter 5 is a commentary of chapter 4. So our study, we're going to be looking at chapter 4, but we will reference some things from chapter 5, which gives us some insight into chapter 4. So we're ready for chapter 4, starting in verse 1. It says this, I'm reading from the New American Standard Version, it says, Then the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord after Ahud died. Last week we looked at the deliverer, the judge Ahud. Ahud's leadership had guided the nation in peace and, and, and reverence and orthodoxy for some 80 years. It was unprecedented. But Ahud's now gone. Same old story, third verse, the people forget God. And when they do, they act like a mob. And the people lapse back into, here it is again, sin. It's the start of the third cycle, idolatry. And God disciplines them. See, God loves us too much to allow us to live in our sin. There's a difference between, I want to give us some foundational understanding. There's a big difference between um, what I want to call religious formation and what I want to call spiritual revival. And when I say revival, try to drift your mind away from, you know, one of those tent revivals, maybe where Billy Graham was speaking or something. 
I, I think there's a big difference between trying to form, shape someone's behavior to religion versus a spiritual renewal that comes from within. See, religious formation is just temporarily changes the outward conduct. But spiritual revival, what it does is permanently, per, permanently alters inward character. Consider an example. When we parent, all we're doing in our humanity, we don't have the power in our children's lives to spiritually transform them. We can't change them from the inside. What we can do, though, is we can set up parameters of behavior. What we can do is we can give them religious parameters to live by, but we can't spiritually renew their heart. We don't have that power. Only God does. And so what we do is we, we religiously form boundaries around them. We give them instruction. We give them barriers in hopes that one day they themselves will be led to some sort of a spiritual revival. See, when... Ehud was removed, the idols, um, when he removed the idols and commanded the people to worship God, the people obeyed. And there were 80 years of people obeying, but when the constraints were removed, when Ehud was removed, what happened then? The people went back to their own desires. And when you begin to consider all that the world is capable of offering to deter behavior is religious formation. It's only religious formation that temporarily changes an outward behavior. Only God, through Jesus, can spiritually renew us, revive us on the inside as to permanently change our inward parts. And we're only changed through the power of the gospel. I was reading recently, and I love this Larry Crabb quote where he says, if you don't understand that the gospel is the answer to all of your problems, you don't understand the gospel. See, many times in our culture, we look at the gospel, that Jesus died according to the scriptures, he was buried according to the scriptures, he rose according to the scriptures. We think of that as a one-time event for the believer, that we apply this one time. I place my faith in Christ that he died on the cross for my sins, and then we become a believer. But you know what? The gospel transforms us on a daily basis. Every day we need to submit to the transformational work of God through his Holy Spirit in our lives. It's the gospel every single day that renews us. If we look at the gospel as just a participant with it one time, well, you know what? No, it's every single day that we submit to what the gospel has for us. Jesus told a parable some 1,500 years after the book of Judges was written, and he tells a story about a man that got rid of a demon Somehow he, got, he had a demon in him and he got rid of it only to cleanse his house. So his heart was still open. It was still empty. And then he goes on to say that same man ended up with seven worse demons in place of that one. The point that Jesus was making in the parable is an empty heart is prey to every form of evil. Our heart can only be filled for eternity by a God who comes from eternity. The question that we need to ask if we're really serious about our relationship with the Lord is to do some self-diagnostics. Is our life marked by a series of just religious formations where we jump through some religious hoops, where our behavior is only periodically changed, and then once we're changed, well, what we do is we revert back to old habits, or have we experienced a spiritual revival? where our heart on the inside is being morphed into God's image. See, one is temporal, but only God can provide the one that's eternal. Well, let's look at verse 2 and 3. So we said the nation of Israel goes back into sin. They follow their own desires. Ahud is no longer around. They drift to their own desires rather than the spiritual standard that Ahud had set. And so it says in verse 2, And the Lord told, sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazar, and the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Horesheth. Verse 3, it says, And the sons of Israel cried to the Lord. And they, and because this king of Jabin, this, um, this ruler, Sisera, who was over the army, they had 900 chariots at their disposal. And he... Jabin oppressed the sons of Israel severely for 20 years. 
once again, the nation of Israel, they sin, and now they're falling into slavery. They're in servitude to this King Jabin of Canaan. There's a pattern in scriptures. And the pattern is this. An individual can learn from other people's mistakes, or an individual can learn from their own mistakes. You know, it's much easier to learn from someone else's mistakes. That's why we study the Bible. The reason we study the Bible is so you learn from someone else's mistakes. Unfortunately, the nation of Israel keeps learning from their own mistakes. And the problem is, we more times than not choose to follow the lesson plan of the Israelites. We, 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 we learn from our own mistakes rather than taking the luxury of learning from someone else's mistakes. And it is costly. It's a costly way to learn when you keep learning from your own mistakes. So he talks about this Jabin, king of Canaan. Now, you have to understand something. Canaan was the land where Israel was occupying. We'll look at the map here in just a second. And there were cities all over this land that were still occupied by the Canaanites. The Canaanites did not seek the Lord. They sought Baal and Asherah. They sought made-up gods, little g-o-d-s. They didn't worship the Lord. And Jabin was kind of the head of all these little city states, so to speak. We would call them mayors today. But back then, if you were in charge of a city, you were called the king of that city. Well, Jabin was kind of the leader of all the conglomeration of all these Canaanite cities. Some called him the king of kings, but he was a counterfeit king of kings. You and I know the real king of kings. Right under Jabin was a guy named Sisera. Sisera was the commander of Jabin's army, and it was a strong army. They had 900 chariots. Now, chariots at that time, were, they were like tanks because a chariot could destroy an army of just a manual army of men. Now, I want to show you the map again, where we were. Again, this is the map of Israel during the time 3,400 years ago, 1,400 years before Christ. The nation was divided up by 12 tribes. You had all of these tribes of Israel, and they all kind of had, they were like counties. This area is really just a little bit bigger than the state of New Jersey. It's not that big. And there's a fellow named Jabin. He was the ruler of all these Canaanite cities in a place called Hazar. And Hazar is about right there in the, within the tribe of Naphtali. And Jabin lived there, but his army lived over there and was ruled by a fellow named Sisera. Sisera lived in Harasheth, right there. And that's where his 900 chariots. Now, something you need to understand about all these Canaanite cities, they kind of ruled the area. And all the Israelites, all these tribes, they bowed down to the Canaanites. And the Canaanites, it says, they were wicked. And they, what they would do is they lived out human trafficking. They would, at their whim, they would take Israelite women from their homes and they would just make them slave, put them into slave bondage, sexual slavery, to whoever Canaanite man wanted them. So if a Canaanite man wanted a woman, he would just say, she's mine, and they would be slaves. It was horrible. So you had sexual slavery. We think we've invented sexual slavery. It's been going on for generations. And it was prevalent here. It was a horrible rule for over 20 years. And we said in verse 3, the sons of Israel, under Jabin's, Jabin's 20 years of cruelty, what do they do? They cry to the Lord, and here you have supplication again. God, how would we get into this thing? Help us out. We're under Jabin. He's taking our women, and he's destroying them. He's destroying our culture. You know, all throughout Scripture, I've, I've often asked the question, how must God feel when the only time we cry to him is when we find ourselves in a pinch. You follow me? It's like many times when things are going good, we don't cry to him. But when things are going poorly, what do we do? Oh, God, help us. How must God feel when we only turn to him when we're in a pinch? And then we make deals with him. Oh, God, if you get me out of this, I'll do this. And then just like the Israelite nation, we forget. You know, I think a better way to pray is to say, God, would you cleanse my heart from sin? 
rather, our prayer, we follow along with the Israelites. We go, God, would you take the suffering away from me? Would you comfort me from suffering? Most of our prayers are in the realm of, oh, God, take this bad circumstance away from me. Whereas our prayer needs to be, God, would you cleanse my heart? Staff guys, just a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at Psalm 51. And you remember in Psalm 51, the psalmist, King David, he says, create in me a clean heart. And in the context of Psalm 51, he says, God, you are just in whatever consequence you see fit to deliver. But while you're doing that, would you just cleanse my heart of sin? I think that is more of an appropriate prayer than saying, God, get me out of this. It's no, Lord, cleanse me in the midst of this. I would rather be in this situation and right with you than to be out of this situation and in poor standing with you. And God is faithful to raise up another deliverer. You know, the book of Judges is really a type of the future. You know, we looked a couple of weeks ago, Othniel was a deliverer of the nation. Ahud was a deliverer of the nation. And now he's going to raise up another judge who's a deliverer for the nation. And the book of Judges talks about these periodic messiahs that deliver the nation. But really what they are are temporary deliverers that point the people to the eternal deliverer. That's why theologians say that Judges is really all about types of Christ. There's something in the Old Testament that's called typology, where individuals are types of Jesus, where they point people ultimately to the one who is the ultimate deliverer. The difference between a judge and Jesus, well, a judge can only point people to religious formation, whereas Jesus is the one who points us to that which is spiritual revival within our heart. And so in verses 4 through 7, God raises up another judge. Let me read it to you again. It's New American Standard. It says, now, verse 4, now Deborah, a woman, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, don't name your boys that, ladies, was judging Israel at the time. Deborah was their judge. She used to sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the sons of Israel would come to her for judgment. Incredibly wise lady. And now she sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kedish Naphtali. By the way, this will be on the test. This will be on the midterm. And he said to him, Behold, the Lord, God of Israel, has commanded, Go and march to Mount Tabor and take with you 10,000 men from the sons of Naphtali and from the sons of Zebulon. And I will draw out to you Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, and his chariots and his many troops by the river Kishon, and I will give them into your hand. God raises up a courageous woman. Her name's Deborah. And she's going to judge the land. This was a male-dominated culture that looked down on women. And Deborah saw herself, according to Judges chapter 5, the commentary about chapter 4, Deborah saw herself as a mother to her people. You know, I'm often reminded that in the absence of men stepping up, God's not afraid to raise up women in historically predominant male roles. And in this situation, you know, I think um, God wasn't afraid to raise up a woman who was going to stand in the gap. She was going to be the one to stand up and say, I'm going to fight against human slavery. I'm going to right the wrongs. I'm going to bring God's will to bear on this piece of property. You know, I think many times when sin is running amok, always in history, the constant within a society are godly women. The variable is men seem to lose their ball in the weeds. And that doesn't mean that all women are godly and all men are louses, but many times when things are not going well in a culture, the passivity of men seems to step back and play the passive game. The constant is women, godly women. You see it throughout history. And Deborah was one of those women. Ruth is another one of those women. Mary is another one of those women. And you see Deborah willing to step in where 
men, and this isn't a slam on women, this is an indictment to the passivity of men. And God revealed to Deborah that Barak was going to assemble a large army of Israelites and ambush Sisera's troops at Mount Tabor. Again, I want to show you the map. Um, Deborah lived in this place down here. It was called Bethel in Ephraim. That's where Deborah lived, and that's where she judged. Now, Barak was the man that Deborah said, I want you now to gather up troops, and you're going to fight against Sisera. Now, it's hard to remember. Sisera was the bad guy. Barak was the good guy. Now, don't go political on me and go, well, I didn't vote for Barak. This is 3,400 years. Don't go political on me and go, well, I didn't vote for Barak. Don't go political on me. This is not about our political system. This was about a man who lived 3,400 years ago. Barak was the good guy. Sisera was the bad guy. So for a short time, just so you can remember that as you're reading through the story, when I say Barak, I want you to go, yay. When I say Sisera, I want you to go, boo. All right? I know you go, Dan, come on. Are we in elementary school? I want to help you remember this, okay? So Barak. Oh, you are so much better in first hour. Sisera. Oh, yeah. Now, I'm not going to make you do this the whole time. It'll get draining after a while. But just to, as we're doing this. So what happened was, over here in Horesheth, this Sisera had his 900 chariots. Thank you. There's a special emphasis of a boo over here. Yes. That was kind of an amen boo. And so you had Horesheth. You had Sisera and his 900 chariots. Now, Barak was over here at, at a place called Mount Tabor. Now, I want you to see something geographically. Now, right here is a place called Mount Tabor. That's where Jesus, by the way, some 1,500 years later, would have his transfiguration, for those of you who know the Gospels. Then down here, there was a place called Mount Gilboa. You'll know around the time of King David that Mount Gilboa, that is where at the base of Mount Gilboa, uh, Saul and Jonathan were killed as they were doing battle with David. Then there was a place over here just south of Issachar called Megiddo, which is a little mountain there. And then over here is a mountain range called um, the Carmel Mountain Range. And so you go from Carmel to Mount Tabor to Mount Gilboa over here to Megiddo, and it kind of forms a crazy little kind of random rectangle, not exactly a rectangle, but there's a valley there. It's called the Jezreel Valley. Another word for it is Armageddon. Significant things in history happen right there in that valley in Issachar called the Jezreel Valley called Armageddon. By the way, anybody who doesn't trust the Lord, bad things happen in that valley, and you'll see that as we go on. But here's what happened is this Sisera is going to attack Barak at Mount Tabor. Now, Barak, what he would do, well, that was weak. Barak, what he would do is he took his army and he did kind of a left, kind of a, a your left, kind of a left end run and a right end run around Mount Tabor. And as Cicero was attacking Mount Tabor, he would come around on both sides and kind of squeeze him on the middle. That was the military strategy. Okay, now you can stop going yay and boo, okay? I just kind of wanted to get it in your mind who was the good guy and who was the bad guy. So now, nobody else do that, all right? So, God has this perfect ambush planned, and the action builds. Let's look at verses 8 through 10. And again, don't, don't give me your comment. Then Barak says to Deborah, Deborah, if you will go with me, then I'll go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. This is passivity that goes along with sin. Come on, really, Barak? You're better than that. In verse 9, and she said, I will surely go with you. Deborah's saying to Barak, I'll go with you. Nevertheless, the honor shall not be yours on the journey that you are about to take. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. In other words, you're not going to get to kill Sisera. I'm going to have a woman kill Sisera. And Deborah rose and went with Barak to Kedesh. 
again, in the absence of men, God is going to raise up women to do that which men should have stepped up to the plate and done. Verse 10, Barak called Zebulon and Naphtali together to Kadesh, and 10,000 men went up with him. Deborah also went up with him. We see the chink in Barak's armor. God gives him a direct command, and he hesitates. We need to understand something. When God gives a command, it is the end of a discussion. And when God gives a command, God enables his command to be fulfilled. And this is a lack of faith on Barak's part. And Deborah, as a result of it, she prophesies. And she says, you know what? I'll go with you, but Sisera won't die in your hands. He'll die at the hands of a woman. And so we know that 10,000 soldiers from Zebulon and Naphtali are gathered together. Let me just show you the map real quick. 10,000 soldiers from Naphtali and Zebulon. Well, they go with Barak over here to Mount Tabor. Later on, chapter 5 says there's also troops from Issachar and Manasseh and Ephraim and Benjamin that go with him, that join in the fray. And even in chapter 5, it says there really was about 40,000 soldiers that, in total that went with Barak and his army. Now in verses 11 and 12, we're introduced to some new characters in the story that are very significant. Look at verse 11 and 12. It says, now Heber, the Kenite, Heber, it kind of sounds like a Sesame Street character's name. Heber, the Kenite, had separated himself from the Kenites. And the son of Hobad, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent as far as the oak of Zenanim, which is near Kadesh. And they sold, and they told Sisera that Barak, the son of Ebenoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. Now, what in the world did I just read? I mean, that's impossible. That's so hard. There's so many names. What's going on? Well, here's what's going on. Heber, he was a Kenite. Kenites had a very close relationship with the tribe of Judah. But Heber's kind of a coward. He wants to keep his options open so that whoever wins between the Israelites and the Canaanites, the Israelites are the good guys, the Canaanites are the bad guys, that he'd keep his options open. And so Heber... He warned Sisera, the Canaanite general, that Deborah and Barak are mounting an army. Again, you see the passivity of men, that Heber's not a man of conviction. He's more concerned with self-preservation than obeying God. So let's go to the battle. Let's go to Mount Tabor and see what happens, found in verses 13 through 16. Verse 13, it says this, Sisera called together all his chariots. How many of them? 900 chariots to be in all, and all the people who were with him from Horesheth to the river Kishon. Meanwhile, Deborah said to Barak, Arise, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Behold, the Lord has gone out before you. Let me stop just a second. Don't miss this. The Lord has gone out before you. The Lord has gone out before you. You know, you can't leave home without that reality. You've got stuff in front of you. Well, I'm leading a Bible study. I'm insignificant. How can I do this? The Lord will go before you. I I'm giving my testimony at the women's retreat. I can't do this. The Lord will go out before you. My wife's giving a talk for the women at the women's retreat. The Lord will go out before her. We go speak at a family life conference about all these marriages that are on the brink. The Lord will go out before you. You go into the fray of your working relationships and go, I've got all these non-believers out there that don't like my Savior. The Lord will go out before you. You know, it ought to be our prayer every morning. I can't do this. We walk in as little scaredy cats into the culture instead of going, the Lord will go out before me. Remember, I told you chapter 5 is a commentary of chapter 4. Let me read to you. Keep that in mind a second. So it says, so Barak went down from Mount Tabar with 10,000 men following him. The Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots uh, and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot. In other words, he escaped from his chariot and fled and he ran. 
But Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as Harasheth, and the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not one was left. I want to show you the map again. Because Sisera runs into a buzzsaw. Remember I said that the Lord would go out before him? There's a river right here that runs through this valley called the Jezreel Valley. It's the river Kishon. During the time that this action is taking place, it's either May or June. May or June in this area of the world is the dry season. Julie and I were there last June. It was dry, really a year and a half June. You remember when we went to Israel? It's dry and it's hot. But chapter 5 reveals something. Because remember it says, and the Lord went before them. The river Kishon, all it is is a creek. You could walk through it. It's ankle deep during the dry season. But what the Lord did is he went before them. And you know what the Lord did? He sent a rain. He sent a flood. And that little Kishon River during the dry season became, in this Jezreel Valley, became full. It was like a lake. Why is that a big deal? Chariots don't maneuver well in mud. They're useless. And so what happened was the Israelite army, under the leadership of Barak, they did a right hand, right in turn and a left in turn around Mount Tabor, and they squeezed this army that was vulnerable now because their number one weapon was useless. And they destroyed that army and cut them to pieces. There was a fellow, though, Jabin, he escaped. We'll get to him in a second. But I don't want you to miss this. You remember Jabin the king and Sisera, the captain of the army? They worshipped foreign gods. They worshipped this made-up god called Baal and Asherah. You know Baal's job, he was the fertility god. It was Baal's job to send the appropriate amount of rain when rain was needed. That was why they worshipped Baal. He was non-existent. He was made up. So when God sent rain and sent it torrentially, what that was was a direct attack on Baal. You guys want to worship Baal? You guys want to worship the one who brings water? I'll give you water. It was God's way of saying, I am the one who is the alpha and the omega. I am the one who reigns. I am the one who goes before you. And you keep trusting in man and you keep trusting in foreign gods. I am the one. And so you want to worship a God who can bring rain? I will show you I am the God who can bring your sustenance. It was a direct assault on the prophet of Baal. Let me remind you that 700 years later, this area called Mount Carmel right here, that was where Elijah destroyed 450 prophets of Baal and arguably another 450 prophets of Asherah. Things don't go well in this valley for those who do not trust in God. So the action builds. Sisera, the Canaanite captain, had fled. We look at verses 17 through 23. Now Sisera fled away on foot. We're going to introduce you to another uh, very important character. Her name is Jael. She lives in north. She lives near Hazar. She's the wife of Heber, the Kenite. Hebar was the guy who was the avoider of conflict. He was the coward. But Jael's not a coward. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazar, and, and, and Heber, the Kenite. In verse 18, it says, as this, as this Sisera was escaping, verse 18, Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, turn aside to me, do not be afraid, and turn aside to her tent. And she covered him with a rug. He's hiding out because he knows the Israelite army is after him. They want to kill him. Barak himself is trying to find him. So they're going from tent to tent to tent. And Jael says, hey, Sisera, come in my tent. I'll cover you up with a rug. He said to her, please give me a little water to drink. I'm thirsty. He's been running a long ways. She didn't just give him water. She gave him a bottle of milk. She gives him red carpet treatment. And then she covered him. I, I just think this is kind of humorous. I mean, if somebody's going to come to the tent, hey, we're looking for Sisera. 
Oh, he's not here under this lump under my living room here. I mean, it's like he's hiding under a rug. I mean, what do you, where do you think you're going to find him? So he's under the rug. He thinks nobody can find me. Stand at the doorway of the tent, he says, and it shall be if anyone comes and inquires of you, if there's anyone here, say to them, no. Now, there's something you need to know before I need, read the next couple of verses. People at that time lived in tents. Women in that culture were the ones who put up the tent. So a woman knew how to swing a mallet. They knew how to drive a peg into the ground. They were the ones who put up the tents. It'll make sense here in just a second. But J.L., Heber's wife, took a tent peg, seized a hammer in her hand, and went secretly to Sisera. He's under the rug. He's asleep. He's exhausted. And she drove that tent peg into his temple. And it said it went through to the ground. She hit it with such force. And he was sound asleep because he was exhausted. So he died. I certainly hope so. <laughs> Remember, because of Barak's hesitation, Deborah said a woman is going to kill Sisera, not you, Barak. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael, the wife of Heber, came out to meet him and said to him, Come, I'll show you the man whom you're seeking. He's got a peg in his head. He entered with her, and behold, Sisera was lying dead with a tent peg in his temple. So God subdued that day Jabin the king of Canaan before the sons of Israel. Jabin has no army. He's powerless. The Canaanite king in Hazor is powerless. Salvation once again comes to the people. See, the Jews had been in a terrible bondage because of Jabin and Cicero for the 20, past 20 years. Women had been sexually trafficked by the Canaanites. And it was God's will to deliver the nation. See, had the Canaanite army escaped, more Jewish woman, women would have been taken captive by the Canaanites and placed into sexual slavery. And it was a woman, J.L., it was a woman, Deborah, that shortened the war and helped bring an end to the Canaanite human trafficking industry. Heber was neutral because he was a coward, but there was a war on. And J.L. and Deborah stepped in with God's enablement to put a stop to it. And then no time to get into it. Verse 24, what happens is Jabin, the king of Canaan, destroyed. And once again, silence comes. And we know that from chapter 5, verse 31, it says the silence would be another 40 years, that this period would last 40 years. Remember I said chapter 5 is a commentary of chapter 4. And Deborah's the one who wrote chapter 5. She writes in chapter 5, she uses the genre of poetry to capture how God had delivered the nation from tyranny. And there's an interesting commentary in chapter 5, verses 28 through 30, that captures the significance of this moment. I want to read that to you. The battle has been won. The nation of Israel is delivered from the Canaanites. But not everybody knows that. And in chapter 5, verses 28 through 30, there's a commentary about Sisera's mom who is waiting for Sisera to come home to bring her the spoils of the battle. Let me read that to you. It's found in chapter 5, verses 28 through 30. Out of the window she looked and lamented. The mother of Sisera threw the lattice. Why does his chariot delay in coming? She's looking for him. Why do the hoofbeats of his chariots tarry? Her wise princesses would answer her. Indeed, she repeats her words to herself. They're telling her everything's okay. Verse 30, are they not finding? Are they not dividing the spoil? She's assuming that her son has won the war. And then she's thinking, wait a minute, he's dividing the spoil. Maybe a maiden, two maidens for every warrior. She's thinking, He's going to come back, and again, the spoils of war with the Israelites, all these women who are, who are trafficked, one for every one of our warriors, maybe two for every one of our warriors. To Sisera, a spoil of dyed work, a spoil of dyed work embroidered. Maybe he's going to bring back from the front a gift to me of fine fabrics that have been embroidered and dyed different colors. 
dyed work of double embroidery on his neck of spoiler. Maybe he'll come back with a beautiful scarf to present to me. Look at what she's placing her hope in. She's placing her hope in his return. She's placing her hope in the spoil that he would bring. She's placing her, her hope in the women, the Israelite women, that will now be slaves to the nation of Canaan. She's placing her hope in all the fabrics from the captured Israelites, maybe a scarf around her neck. What a pathetic picture of placing your hope in the wrong thing. Sisera's mom, placing her hope in the wrong thing. Please hear me. If we place our hope in that which is evil and destructive, we will be as disappointed as a mother that is informed her son is not coming home. The disappointment is severe when we hope in the wrong things. The application of this little story, where's your hope? Is your hope in temporary relief delivery mechanisms? Where maybe these temporary messiahs, my hope is in the wealth that's coming my way. My hope is in the possessions that are coming my way. My hope is in people that will make me happy. My hope is in my team that will win, go Chiefs. You know what, when you put your hope in temporary things, what will happen is you will find, you will have some temporary relief, no doubt about it but that will soon turn and be replaced by deep disappointment. See, we are creatures of eternity. We were created to experience eternal satisfaction. We work best when we submit to spiritual renewal that only God can provide. We work best when we seek God as the answer to our problems, not religious temporary transformations. I think the 21st century church, as we look back on it, will be known for looking for temporary relief versus looking for eternal reality. Bow your heads with me. Lord God, I pray that we would be courageous to embrace the life you've given us, to say, God, not don't change my circumstances, but make my heart pure in the midst of bad circumstances. Lord, would you give me the, 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 the mental toughness to say, I don't want to jump through religious hoops. I want spiritual revival in my own heart so that I'm not blown to and from during my times of ease and comfort, but I am steadfast and movable in the work of what you have for us. God, I pray that we would place our hope where our hope belongs, in you and you alone. We were created for spiritual revival. We were not created for religious temporary renewal. I don't know where everybody is. But with your heads bowed, your eyes closed, and your heart fixed on God, ask the court, where is your hope? Is it in Jesus? The one who is significant to answer all of your questions, all of life's problems. Place your trust in him the one who has delivered you from the domain of darkness so that you can live not blown to and fro by circumstances, but live steadfast, immovable in your relationship with him, no matter what the circumstances. Place your trust in him. The only one who's able to take all your sins and take them as far and throw them as far as it is from east to west. Ask God to make you tired of just outward behavior cover-ups. God, will you do that in us? Only you can do that. 
And now, Lord, in our gratitude, we don't ask you for ease and comfort. We want to financially give because it's the right thing to do for your kingdom to be expanded. And Lord, we want you to massage our hearts, get us in line with your perfect will as we submit together and we sing as we end our time together. Thank you that you are the one who takes a lesson 3,400 years ago and infuses it into our clay souls today. And all God's people said, amen.